<laughs> you know what you were saying earlier about us always doing the same thing? Yeah, I don't know, I've been thinking about it and I think it's pretty perceptive. We should do something new, something, something totally out of hand. Yeah? Yeah. Like what? Your dad's away for work, right? Tonight, we should take his BMW, drive it into Boston, and then, what? Ferris Bueller's day off. What? You're kidding, right? Oh, come on, Ty, it'll be fun, okay? Come along, get in the car. No. Come on, we'll bring it back in the morning. No one will even know it's gone. Okay, fine. Then I'll drive. Ten seconds to get out of this car. Okay. You know, you are such a drag. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, you should be grateful. If I wasn't, your life would be a mess. That's not true. Yes, it is. If I didn't pull you by your teeth into applying for college and be living in your parents' house till you were 25. Mm. Yeah. Did apply, didn't you? I... I... No. 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 No? Okay, I didn't want to. Charlie, we've been talking about going to this school since the second grade. Yeah. You were the one who told me to apply. Okay, yeah, I know that. <laughs> so I don't know what to say, Charlie. Do you ever get tired of it? No. I don't.
tomorrow? That Bronco is going to be ours this year, Bob. Yep, I hope so. You get a look at her. All smooth and shiny black. Red striped decal running down the sides. Black leather interior bucket seats. Imagine driving around in that thing. <laughs> Even comes with those AM FM stereo cassette CD players. Tammy Wynette would sound really good then. Plus, the back seats fold down. <laughs> and that engine, oof -ta. Eight cylinders, overhead cam, 500 plus cubic inches. A real beaut, a beaut. <sighs> Even comes with those new Firestone puncture resistant tires oh, that you can just, just keep could, driving. I, 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 got, I got a nibble, I got a nibble. Yep, 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 he's up. Get the pail over here. This yep. is the one, Knut. This is the big one. Yeah, could be the fish that wins us that Bronco. Oh, he's sure a fighter, boy. We'll pull him in through then. Uh, yeah, yeah, just making sure he's not getting hung up on the ice. You know, we got to be careful about things like that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, well, I see him now. Pull him on through. Yeah, I got to get him past the bottom of the ice. Here he comes. Oh. Uh, considering the size, he, he was a, sure was a fighter. How many of those perch we caught so far today, anyway? Must be a whole school of them stupid little buggers down there. <laughs> Ain't gonna win the Bronco at this rate. Oh, no, don't go saying that, Knut. Uh, you know, them fish are betting pretty good this year. I bet you we got a good chance at winning that rig. I don't see very many of them other guys around here pulling in as many perch as we are. And where there's perch, there's northern pike. DNR must have seeded the whole lake down with that little scrap. Well, we'll get that Bronco. Day's young yet. You get two choices with a lake, Bob. You either get a lake with a few big fish, or you get a lake with a lot of little fish. What kind of a lake do you think we got this year? Judging by what's in the bucket there, the lake's full of perch. I don't know. I, I, I've been watching old Ivan Pooch over there, and he hasn't caught a damn thing. <laughs> 20 years we've been coming to this contest, Bob. 20 long years. Oh, more than that. I mean, I, the first time we came uh, with little Bobby, he was like six years old, and, and now he's a big shot down in Minneapolis. Boy, the time goes. I want that Bronco, Bob. Heck, you're telling me. Well, every year there's a fancy new Ford, and every year some punk drives off with her. Well, that's the way it goes, but I mean, today the, the weather's pretty good, the sun's shining, it's uh, pretty 20 degrees, and I brought some brew along in case you get a little thirsty there, Knut. The whole cooler is chock full. Well, maybe later. Yep, okay, well, you help yourself whenever. Bob, I got a way we can win. Oh, you do, do you? Well, I said in my prayers last night too, Knut. I brought something with. Oh, something that'll let us win for sure. Oh, some, some sort of secret lure? Nope. No? It's a northern, Bob. Northern? <laughs> what you saying there? A big one. Bugger's still half alive. He's nearly 12 pounds. It'd be an easy thing to do. We, we just hook him on a line and drop him down the hole here. Then we give out a hoot and a holler and drag the darn thing back up here again. The whole lake would be watching us with all the shouting. We'd win that Bronco, Bob. <laughs> You're such a kidder, Knut. You ain't got no fish along. It's in the cooler. There's beer in that cooler. I unpacked the beer. Ah, you're full of bull. Well, take a look then. Jeez, Knut. Take a look, for cripe's sake. Oh, uh, you've got Bronco on the brain. That's what you got, Knut. Bronco on the brain. All right, let's see this here mighty fish. 
Oh, jeez! <laughs> Just like an aquarium, ain't it? Only you can't see through the sides. That way the contest officiators couldn't see the little ace I got in there. Is that a contest winner or what? Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, that's bad. Oh, jeez. Sit down, Bob, and pretend something's biting your hook. Oh. Old Ivan's getting suspicious. He's looking over here. Well, where'd you put my beer, Knut? Oh, uh, come on, something's biting your hook. Oh, damn it. Uh, quick, quick, uh, hook him, hook him. Oh, damn it, he got away. <laughs> Look out, Ivan. Bob here just missed the contest winner. He, he's uh, heading your way. Ivan's practically deaf, ain't he? You mean to say you plan on cheating here, Knut? He's just too proud to get a hearing aid. That's Ivan's whole problem. He's just too proud. They catch us with that fish, and, and we're banned from this contest for life. What about the Bronco, Bob? The prize? We'd look pretty smart behind the wheel of that thing. Oh, jeez. Where'd you get that northern? Oh, that fish farm down by Henning. Oh, shit. That, that guy's probably here at the contest right now. He loves promoting this thing. That's why you got to catch the fish for us, Bob. With that fish farmer here, knowing my luck, he'd remember where I was yesterday. I catch it? No, 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 no. I ain't agreeing to nothing like that. You and I never win, Bob. We never win a thing. I want a fish, Knut. Just fish. Need something nice in my life, Bob. Something, something fancy. My whole life is crap. Crap house. Crap truck, crap TV, crap business. After 30 goddamn years of trucking, me and the missus got nothing to show for it. Crap! Forget about that northern fish. This ain't about being right or fair. It's just about guys like us can't get things the normal way. All, I mean, look at all the situations you've been in after all these years. I know you, Bob. I know you. I've seen you cry just that once at the auction sale when they were taking all that equipment Shut off the farm. Shut up there, Canute, or I'm going back to the truck. Okay, okay. We'll do it the traditional way. I just want to fish. Well, fish then. Forget about it. Ripes almighty. Now even them little buggers aren't biting. Maybe they got scared off by a couple of big northerns. Yeah, probably so. Where'd you stash my beer? Oh, it's in the workbench in your garage. Oh, I like a little beer when I fish. Yeah, beer's nice. I think something will bite sooner or later. Huh, you'd think so. They were biting here pretty good a little bit ago. We haven't seen old Ivan Pooch pull out anything yet. Only thing he's pulled out is a fresh can of Copenhagen. So, uh, what would we do with that Bronco? Uh, do you have it for a week? Can I have it for a week? Or what does it? So, I'd buy your half from you. Buy half? Well, it's worth 30000 I'd get a loan and pay you fifteen. I get the Bronco, you get 15000 free and clear. Well, you, you put yourself in pretty deep debt then. Oh, hell, what's a little bit more? Finally get to drive something decent. I'm tired of driving that worn-out old Toyota. The wife doesn't much like driving it either. But she'd sure drive all over the country in that Bronco. 15000 I get worried, too, you know, when she's driving that pick up in the winter, especially when I'm hauling beef down to Chicago. The heater don't work in that thing good either, and, and you know, I'm not here. I call her every night when I'm gone. Oh, well, I just want to make sure that, that she's, well, that she didn't have any trouble with, the, with that pickup. 15,000 is a lot of money for you, Knut. 
For a Bronco? Heck no, that's cheap. Oh, for a Bronco, yeah, sure, that's cheap. You can't get, not, I mean, a roller skate with, with wheels for 15000 Yeah, don't buy much these days. Hey there, look. Ivan's got something. I, I see him, he's, he's pulling a fish up. Ivan? Yeah, get, get out your binoculars. Oh, hang on, hang on. Is it big? Cripes almighty, it ain't small. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's a contender. Nice song, yeah. It's a northern. Yeah, he's heading over to the judge's tent to get it weighed in. Oh, jeez, oh, jeez, oh, jeez. Yeah, it's big, but it's not as big as what we got in the cooler. Oh, jeez. Uh, I'd say our northern's got about three pounds on him. Yeah, at, at least three pounds. I wonder what Ivan would do with a Bronco. Ah, uh, he won't get it. Somebody will also pull in a northern pike that'll make that one look like a bullhead. Yeah. Probably so. Somebody else. Somebody else. Fifteen thousand. <sighs> sure could do a lot with that. Oh yeah? Yeah. Like what? Living room needs new carpet. That weave we got right now is looking pretty tin. Wife's starting to throw rugs over it. It's gotten so, uh, what does she call it? Uh, uh, Pepilly got you know, those nubs all over it. Looks terrible. Well, you should know. You you've seen it. Oh, I don't know. I haven't. Oh, no, I see. I you haven't sure seen. know what I'm talking about. You've seen it, Bob. I don't think it's my place to talk about another man's carpet. You're a good guy, Knut. Now would be the time to put on your northern while Ivan's gone. Well, I wasn't going to say nothing, but yeah, that's true. I mean, he's the only one close enough to really see us, if, if we were to... It sounds like uh, you want to do oh, it Oh, no, 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 no. I was just saying that now would be the time, if we were to, uh, with that northern. Yep, uh, Ivan's not going to catch many more fish like that today. Yeah, but geez, we could still get caught. Well, that's the problem, of course. Not that we'd go to jail. we just have to give back the Bronco. Now you'd have to give back the Bronco. Well, and you'd have to give me back my 15000 Well, I'd wait on spending it till spring anyway. Well, smart move. Well, I've always been smart. Just never been lucky. Ivan's not heading back yet, is he? T -t Take a look. Nope, he's still in the tent. So, we put the northern on my hook then? Yeah, pull your line out of the hole and I'll get him set for you. Okay, do it quick. Well, yeah, I ain't gonna be slow about it. Toss me your line. Make sure you get that hook in good. <laughs> yeah, I'm not releasing this expensive mother for some other fool to yeah, catch. Okay, okay, then hurry up then there. Jeez, geez, you're pokey. Oh, hang on, hang on. Okay, I got him hooked good now. Uh, yeah, oh, jeez. Someone's walking out of the tent. Well, we're actually doing this. Cripes almighty. Is he hooked deep enough? Well, are you sure about this here? Well, uh, Ivan's coming. Yeah? I don't know. Uh, throw it down my hole. Ivan will see us pretty soon. Boy, we're committed now. Yeah. Well, Ivan's close enough. You start pulling him in and I'll start shouting. Yeah. Start pulling on your pole. Okay, okay, okay. Come on, it's the catch of your life. Get excited. Yeah. Hey, Canute, I got myself a big one. Is he a fighter? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's a fighter. Oh, well, I'll get the pail ready. Yeah, you better get the pail ready. Hey, Knut, what do I do now? This, this has to look good. I don't know. Yell, yell. It's a big one. Uh, well, yeah, okay. He's a big one, Knut. Louder. He's big. I don't know if I can get the bugger out of the hole. Oh, I was looking this way, isn't he? Oh, he sees it. Now, now that's a fish. Come on, Bob, we've got to head over to the judge's tent and weigh in this contender. Yeah, we better. Give me a ride in that Bronco this afternoon? Oh, we'll be 
Driving that beaut all night, Bob. All yeah. night. Yeah, I suppose. Okay there, then? Yeah. I'm okay. Don't call this place a nursing home. The nurses here don't like it. Elder care facility. But everywhere is nice nowadays. When I was little on our farm, no running water, no electricity, no phone, no radio, no car. Wood burning stove, two mules, a cow, and chickens. Oh, hated plucking chickens. Eating's good, but plucking? Huh, you can have it. Chores. It's all there was as soon as I could tote a pail. Kenny, poor Kenny, died of strep at seven. That was hard. Of strep. And such a gentle, lovely boy. We didn't have drugs then, so he died. But I remember Kenny. You remember, too. <laughs> he would have loved you. Every now and then, we'd see a fella walk toward the house to ask for work. No work. It's like a game, see. There's no work because there's no money. And everybody knew, but hunger didn't kill their pride, so men come up and ask for work. And Mama... She'd send him to the barn, and after supper, after we'd had our fill, she'd make a plate and send my daddy to the barn. Us kids would follow, hang outside, and listen. Daddy gave him such respect. He was kind and generous. My daddy's not what you would call religious. Can't say he believed, but somehow, he could live it. One time, I remember clearly because we had lost a mule the week before. A man come and asked for work and he was looking bad. His color was wrong, so thin, no shoes. They all looked bad, but he looked worse. A frightening, maybe frightened look. But Mama sends him to the barn, like all the rest, like everything's just dandy. After supper, Mama fixes him a special plate, puts jelly on his biscuit. We saw jelly on our biscuit, birthdays maybe, maybe Christmas. Something's up. Can't suss it out. Daddy takes this man a plate. And he brings along a blanket and a pillow. Well, I never. We go out and here's this man. He's looking bad can barely move and has trouble talking. Daddy helps him eat. Eat slow. Took the time to taste, but he clears his plate. Then Daddy makes a place for him to sleep and somehow we know this man is dying. Not like Kenny. Not so hard, but dying just the same. And all night long, my daddy holds his hand. Same as he held Kenny's hand. 
and sometime in the night the stranger passed, well fed, with his head on a pillow and his hand being held. You think it's not too much to ask to leave this world while somebody holds your hand. But all the time here, people die alone. Who'd have thought I'd live to envy that poor man? He's dying in our barn. I'm Meg Doherty from Ithaca, New York. That autumn, she lived above him in the aging brick apartment building and often listened to the sounds that rose up from his flat through the stained oak floor. She would lay a warm ear against the cool wood and breathlessly eavesdrop on his world. She seemed to disappear and float quietly in the muted room below that often became a remote island in her mind. When she listened, and she always listened, she heard his every move. The radio was left on a lot, most of the time purring with old-time jazz tunes or moaning with news on the hour. She felt she knew her downstairs neighbor by the music he played. It was old schmaltzy jazz stuff. The scratchy songs with the whining vocalist and saxophone. Sometimes the music made her sad. The news was always turned up loud during the broadcast, then quiet but audible when the gray and gloomy stories were over. She would often roll over and stare at her milky beige ceiling, the old stucco vibrating and undulating with the flickering bulb. She believed her stirring thoughts caused the light to change. And once again, she'd close her eyes and listen to her heart lightly sounding against her ribs. Sometimes her old typewriter clicked and popped as she banged out a few words a day sometimes a page. She would create a poem or a letter or work on a piece of prose about a feeling or the moment. Her lips spoke the words as the war era Olympia typed and inked the letters on the page. The wire trash bin was stuffed with crumbled papers. She liked to write but not to immediately read her writing. She kept most of the finished pages in a pleated box in the closet. And after hovering for weeks over the same piece, she sometimes sent an unsolicited poem or short story to a literary magazine. In the early morning, the sun often found her sitting at the small desk, typing very sleepily, or resting her head on her hand. She had a long term of unemployment where she sat in her apartment, wrote a poem or two, and read books or old magazines. She would watch the tenants come and go, wondering who lived where, and all the while guessing about their furnishings and the color of their carpeted bedrooms. When her downstairs neighbor came home, she would sit completely still and listen as his door squeaked open and banged shut. His keys would land in a wooden bowl on a table on the hall, and the hinges of a closet door would whine lightly as he hung up his coat. The closet doorknob rattled and clicked when it was closed. The apartments were identical in design, 
So she knew exactly where he was as he moved through his flat. She tiptoed around him above him as he ran a bath, made some calls, and boiled water for dinner. Neither of them had any substantial rugs, and she could hear his shoes clacking as he walked down the little hall to the bedroom. From the trash bin behind the building, she found out he drank a lot of red rose tea. She then, too, became an avid tea drinker and made a small but serious ritual out of each and every cup. When his phone was dialed, it let out a winding sound like the whirl of an old elevator slowing down. She could make out the numbers he dialed by the length of time it took for the disk to return to zero. He often hung up the phone with a slam. She felt a murky pang of jealousy when he spoke on the phone to his dates, calling them love, darling, and princess. She wondered about these women he talked to. Were they beautiful? Were they well-dressed? Tall? Or short? Slim? Broad? Or what? Sometimes she pictured herself in his flat, sitting in his living room, or on the other end of his phone, and she longed to speak to him directly. When she saw him in the bland halls of the pre-war building, he always lightly brushed her off. Later she realized that the downstairs neighbor was a fairly reserved man, and many of his conversations were with his family. He always talked to them on Sunday nights, speaking loudly into the phone, saying, Yes, Mother. No, Father. She liked the fact that he was always in touch with his parents. He must be a good man, a good person, she thought. She wished that she, too, could talk to her family in that manner. But they didn't respect her wishes and she didn't get along with people very well. Her phone was usually silent. When the downstairs neighbor would take a bath, she would walk lightly into her bathroom. Sitting on the closed porcelain, she listened closely to the sounds rising up through the dusty air vent. She imagined the ring of dirt and oil he left on the enamel after a soak and she had an endearing desire to clean the tub for him. When her thoughts would sometimes swerve into snarled images of romantic lust, weddings, marriages, and children, she would quickly put on a coat and go out for a brisk walk. Moving by the building, she would peer up at his second story window and hope that maybe, by accident, she would get his attention. She would usually walk around the block a few times and then lean against the slanted tree beneath his window. She'd stare at the panes of glass reflecting the dust of the sky. His drapes were most often closed by day and oddly half open at night. He had no houseplants, she surmised, because if he did, they would all be dead. She walked away, always looking up at his window and softly moved along through the crunching autumn leaves, dropping, dropping quietly, quietly through the chilly evening air. There was one cool and breezy night where she went for her usual walk after sunset. She wore a long coat with flaps that flipped about in the wind. The cold air chilled her legs as she bounded around the block. She knew he wasn't home yet, but she stilled, leaned against the tree, and stared at his window. She threw a small stone up, but missed. She threw another that clicked lightly against the glass. She hid behind the tree. The curtain stayed still. That night, she had a brief dream. It was a simple conversation with her downstairs neighbor. Waking with dry lips, she couldn't quite discern if the experience was real or imagined. 
The tea kettle squealed as she broke away from her dreamy memories. She turned off the gas and watched the steam disappear into the dusty light above the stove. The morning was cloudy and it looked like it could rain at any minute. That afternoon, she went out with her big, second-hand, boxy black leather briefcase. She wore an odd plaid skirt and a white chemise up to her chin. Her overcoat was buttoned up tight. The belt awkwardly sashed across her waist. She looked like a slightly disheveled female soldier. Her flat, dainty, and sensible shoes were completely out of place. She walked from her house to a bus station nearby. After a transfer, she arrived at an office two flights up. The receptionist's position has been filled. She stood there in her overcoat still to the naked eye, but shivering in her skin. She was speechless. You're welcome, she said quietly as she took a step back spun around slowly and left the room. Her shoes clicked louder than ever as she walked down the worn stairs she had just come up. Blank, exhausted, but somewhat lucid, she walked along like in a dream, one step at a time beneath the cool gray skyscrapers. She wondered just how many people were doing stupid jobs behind countless steel and glass windows, all of them neatly tucked into cubicles and stuffy offices. All those busy bees selling and selling and buying and selling stuff. Stuff! All those papers to file and letters to type from boring dictation. All those loud and desperate phones constantly ringing and the typewriters relentlessly rattling away. All those men in blue suits and paneled boardrooms constantly seeking and making money and producing waste and pollution and consuming. Always consuming. All those dirty plates and coffee cups to clear and set on cafe tables. All those smoky customers leering and pat breakfast. Working, working, working just to survive. She didn't want any of those jobs. She felt deceived by the newspaper, by the one ad. Classifieds are so often misleading. She always wanted to be a writer. A mystical writer of ethereal poems, prose, and best-selling epic stories of adventure and romance. Her typewriter was old and worn out, but it worked. She spent a lot of time staring at her desk, staring at the keys until the words finally came one letter at a time. The sentences came to her faster than her hands could type, and large portions of text that flashed through her mind would be lost. Frustration would get the best of her, and that day of job hunting was no different. On the way home, she kicked through the leaves on the sidewalk and finally made her way to the front steps of the building without looking up, her flat scraped against the old granite stairs. When she reached the top of her stairs and entered the foyer, her downstairs neighbor was leaning against the dull brass mailboxes. Staring at his mail, he moved out of the way while reading. The letter he read was on lavender stationery with a matching envelope, perfumed almost like sweet cinnamon, five or six pages long. Her nostrils flared as she drew in the fragrance and said softly, Hello. He looked up with a smile and said, Hi, and immediately returned to his letter. She stood still for a moment and turned to get her mail. There were a few letters, some bills, and junk mail. In the pile, an envelope from a literary magazine she had submitted a short story to some months ago. She ripped open the envelope, and sour words were immediately written on her face. 
Her hand slowly dropped. She closed her mailbox, 301, and turned to walk away. Bad news, she said, folding the purple pages as she brushed by. Her head jerked around while he spoke. Uh, no, well, yes, not, not really. Just a rejection notice from my magazine. I had sent in a short story a while back, and they just got back to me. You live in 301, right above me. Are you a writer? He asked with a grin and a flick of his eyebrows. I actually heard your typewriter clicking away late, and even sometimes really early in the morning. You were a night owl. She was a bit shocked at his intimate knowledge of her. It never occurred to her that he, too, could follow her movements and habits. She suddenly realized that she lived above him. She lived above him. He can hear her every move. Her mouth was stuck open. Is that a love letter, she blurted out? It's, it's so fragrant. No, not really, he said. It's from my sister. She went to Paris and now always loads her letters with cologne she bought there. Perfume, she interjected. Men wear cologne and women wear perfume. Right, cologne, perfume, right. He smiled a little and her eyes brightened. He could tell she was somewhat smitten. She remembered her dream in an instantaneous flash from her sleeping images of that morning. Her eyes gazed for a moment. Would, would you care to have a cup of tea or coffee with me sometime? She was shocked at her own boldness. boldness. Uh, uh, y yeah, he said after a pause and a small grin. Why, why, when? He asked slightly reluctantly. <clears throat> she cleared her throat. <clears throat> um, uh, how about, uh, tomorrow? At, uh, four? Or, or maybe five? Well, tea is usually served at 4 p.m., right? Yes, she said, smiling with raised eyebrows as she stepped out of his way. Saturday afternoon, that should be fine, he said, drawing out the word fine. What should I bring? Nothing. I have everything, she replied. Okay, see you then. I'll knock when I get home. Take care. He turned and left the building. As she watched him disappear, the door slowly swung closed. Her reflection vibrated in the opaque glass. Her mascara was smeared and her collar crumpled. She quickly ran off to her flat to change her clothes. The tea kettle squealed as she buttoned her jeans. She sipped her tea, leaning on the window ledge, and watched the sun drop behind the downtown building. She sat for a few hours and watched and waited for her downstairs neighbor to return. He did not come home while she was awake. At some point in the night, she was startled out of her nap, her heart nearly leaping out of her throat as she lunged for the window. Nothing. She darted to the little apartment foyer and laid her ear on the floor listening below. Silence. Moments passed like an eternity, and finally soft tones of a feminine voice rose up through the wood. She could hear the downstairs neighbor's voice laughing and trailing off towards the kitchen, then back to the living room. A small crash of something hit the floor, a wine glass perhaps, and his guest giggled and repeated apologies over and over. She hated her neighbor, and she hated his guest. With every word that stuttered from the floor below, her ear was pressed harder and harder against the floor and moved closer to the sounds, finally become enveloped in the voices. Again, silence. She stood up and moved to the window. There was a beam of light projected on the darkened leaves below. Shadows moved like a puppet show across the ground from the neighbor and his guest. They were embracing and seemingly kissing near the window below. 
How could he? She said to herself, pushing at her temples with both hands, fingers bending under the pressure. She moved about her flat, slamming doors and cabinets and repeating, How could he? How could he? She went on for a number of minutes. Then everything stopped. No noise from downstairs. No more giggles and voices. The quiet of 10 p.m. She turned her head to listen. A television was on somewhere. An engine idled down the block. A shower was running. A car alarm sounded. And a freight train moved through the industrial section miles away. A quiet noise. A deafening silence. Except for quiet moaning from below. She dashed to her window and saw no more silhouettes, but heard the voices directly beneath her feet. She turned and ran to her broom closet, unscrewing the red pole attached to the mop. The idea was clear in her head. Duct tape and wire from the junk drawer were set down on the living room floor. A small vanity mirror with a long handle was the final ingredient. She wired the mirror to the stick, added the tape for stability, and created a contraption that looked like a four-foot long dental mirror. It all came together in less than three minutes. The moaning increased from the apartment below. After dimming the lights, she grabbed a set of folding opera glasses her grandmother had given her when she was young. She went to the window, opened it all the way, leaned way out, trying to peer down to her neighbor's flat. Almost losing her balance, she grasped and came back inside. She took the mirror on the stick and slid it out along the sill, propped it steady with one foot, and grabbed the mini binoculars and tried to focus on the reflection in the glass. The mirror was reflecting the most intimate scene of carnal lust, more in depth than any other image or description of eroticism she had ever seen. Her eyes blurred and stung inside the opera glasses, and the mirror contraption almost fell away from the edge. She caught it as it rolled. She grabbed more books and popped them on the stick. She focused the binoculars again. The half-drawn curtains of the room below barely concealed the most intimate acts ever witnessed by the upstairs neighbor. Her heart pounded in her head. The image... His guest was a man. A man? Two men? The voice she heard. She thought it was a woman. Amazed. She could not take her eyes off the scene. She found the glasses again. She crumpled to the floor, sending the opera glasses across the wood and fell into a trance in the half light of her living room. She woke up an hour or two later and remembered a distant dream. The image of a love letter lying open on a table, the pages spilling out. The picture disappeared as her eyes focused on the dimly lit bulb on the ceiling. She stood up and went to the window. The mirror and stick still hung above the ground. No light or sounds came from below, and she pulled her contraption in. She stared at it lying on the floor and started to laugh, and then softly cried. She closed the window sobbing and pulled the blinds, moving slowly to the bedroom. She pushed off her unbuttoned jeans and her foot found the opera glasses. She stepped over them and got into bed. She laughed and cried herself to sleep, wondering all the while if she would actually be brave enough to have tea with the man who lived below. Tea! Tea, tea with, with the downstairs, downstairs neighbor. neighbor! The idea the that that seemed seemed absolutely absurd. absurd. In, In And as she fled the waking world once again, her soul stirred with molten thoughts of slickened bodies engaged and entangled. She saw in her mind a double image in the binoculars, her eyes glazing with tears against the glass, 
washing the image down to the bottom of the view, leaving finally nothing but the darkened color of sleep in the opaque bedroom of apartment 301.